Hello and welcome everyone to the last session of the Upstream Ahead Day 1. Well, it is the insight session and we are going to talk about the importance of digital transformation in the ENP sector. And to start the session, may I call upon the chairman of the session, Sri Pankaj Kumar Goswami, Director Operations, Oil India Limited. He took over as the director on the board of the company on 1st June 2000. Prior to that, he was holding the position of Chief General Manager at Field Headquarter at Dulyajan, Assam. We welcome you, sir. We also have the esteemed panelists with us. May I call upon Sri P.K. Painoli. He, was, he has been the faculty of UPES Dehradun. His recent publications include some international journals, amongst many others, like qualitative and quantitative views of partial stacks in seismic interpretation, case studies from West Africa, 2016 ICE Barcelona. We welcome you, sir. We also have Sri Indradyumna Datta. He is leading the IT and digital function in Cairn Oil and Gas, Vedanta Limited, responsible for designing the technology roadmap aligned with business objectives of higher recovery, greater resources and reserves, better asset integrity and reliability, driving efficient operations, more automated business and improved HSE. We welcome you, sir. We also have amongst us Sri Anup Sharma, Sharma from ONGC. He is the ex ed CIO ONGC. He has been actively involved in large IT project implementation, SCADA, and networking projects in offshore and onshore, paperless journey of ONGC, along with its extension in paperless ECEPC and board meetings of ONGC group of companies, Information Security Operations Center. We welcome you, sir. We also have our co-chair with us, Sri K.K. Nayak. Mr. Kitish Kumar Nayak has more than 32 years of experience in senior positions in oil and gas industry. He started his career in Oil India Limited, then Saudi Aramco, and other drilling companies in India and abroad. While he was serving in PDO Shell Oman from 2004 to 2009, he got an award from the then Prime Minister of India in Oman for his outstanding contribution in increasing oil production in North Oman in November 2008. We welcome you, sir. And may I please request you to commence the session today? Yeah, I, I request session chair to, you know, initiate the proceedings. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sanjima. Thank you, Kitesh. Uh, good evening and welcome to today's session. So this is a very important session, the importance of digital transformation in ENP sector. So basically, uh, uh, if we talk about the digital transform transformation, it's an evolving thing uh, as a key catalyst of uh, bringing reforms in the world around us. And uh, if we see during uh, last uh, five years, that there was a total downturn of oil price, then there were cost overruns. And during last uh, year, there, there was COVID-19 and which has made digital technology an unprecedented need. And uh, I think uh, it's a core agenda of all ENP companies uh, as of now. So uh, in fact, the, so far I can see uh, the ENP companies journey towards digital transformation possibly started in 1960s or maybe within that time and with adoption of telecommunication technologies initially. And in that era, the adoption of voice communications for business and for communication uh, in uh, far-flung areas gave a powerful tool to support our core business, uh, basically drilling and exploration and all those businesses, mostly a seismic. Uh, with the adoption of uh, computer for seismic data, then processing subsequently, and induction of PCs for business computing, then came ENP companies started trading digital uh, journey. And with this, uh, I think the working and cultural landscape of ENP companies went through major changes. And with improvement of data technologies in industry, organizations started with ERP and ERP platforms came in and which was a big leap for traditional way of doing business 
and workflow, uh, entire workflow management chains. Then uh, the operation technology front, uh, the, bringing, uh, has, the beginning happened with the inception of SCADA system. Basically, most of the companies started taking SCADA system that helped the ENP companies to monitor food oil movement, real time operation, uh, uh, all these parameters. And but noticeably, there was a gap between IT and uh, it, uh, operation technology OT, and that remained always in the ENP industries. And uh, comparing the SCADA data with the ERP data was a big challenge, all, as always. However, with recent digital transformation initiatives, ENP companies uh, now started focusing on bringing the same in the same same platform. And uh, today, uh, today's disruptive world of IT and OT must work hand in hand. As you can all, all we definitely appreciate uh, to uh, achieve greater business. So, uh, if we talk about Indian ENP industry today, uh, is at very inflection point of policy reforms. Very recently, we the ENP fraternity, all the ENP, ENP fraternity of India, jointly unfolded a new benchmark uh, of 40 mmt of oil and 50 bcm of gas uh, to be achieved by 24-25 with the strategy to intensify exploration, then monetize discoveries, and maximize recovery with technology induction and digital transformation as one of the main agenda points. So digital is the toolkit for next wave of growth and value to unlock opportunity by transforming the core business process. <coughs> Considering the overall national priority, uh, I could see there are six uh, key priority areas. One is to accelerate exploration, then geophysical study, then fast track field development, then enhance production and recovery, and uh, enhance the HSC parameters, then improve productivity and reduce cost, and foster collaboration. And with adoption of recently path breaking digital technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, all those things definitely will be able to transform the entire business. And there will be real time monitoring has already started in drilling and production activities. And uh, similarly, other uh, yeah, digital technologies are coming in in a big way. So the challenge is now to select the right technologies and seamlessly induct the same uh, into ENP organizational culture, uh, culture uh, which proper change of management initiative. So to enable digital across uh, Indian ENP industry, all key stakeholders, uh, the government, regulator, operator, then uh, again, the all field service providers, they need to come together in a same platform and work collaboratively uh, to drive this uh, model of digital transformation. So, and that is why uh, this session is uh, so important uh, that we have representatives from academia, uh, Mr. Finally, UPES Dehradun, from whom we'd like to hear about the preparation being done by universities to train the millennials and the Zen Z, uh, which are the newcomers, for replacing the old and uh, aging workforce in the NP sector. We have uh, senior representatives from uh, Kane Oil and Gas and uh, also ONGC, from whom, uh, whom uh, we expect to hear the use of digital technology for enhancing recoveries in using fields and other uh, such areas. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, with us uh, uh, this uh, Mr. Nayak as uh, co-chair, I think he will be also uh, delivering on uh, this uh, topic. And uh, I welcome all of you to this session. And uh, I would, uh, I hope our friends from ONGC, Karen, UPS, and would uh, definitely enlighten all of us and further on the subject during the subsequent sessions with deeper focus around policy framework required for accelerating capital accelerating the capitalization of digital technologies and with this uh, session we'll uh, have a very fruitful insight to shape the future of ENP sector. So uh, this is uh, what uh, I have to say and uh, I request uh, I will ask now to Mr. Nayak uh, to go uh, continue with the session. So uh, uh, Mr. Nayak please uh, you can start the next part of the session. So our London speakers will have it more. Now I'll request uh, Mr. Penuli to start his uh, speech uh, uh, and he's already been introduced by Chandrima. All right, so uh, good good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, session chair and uh, co chair, Mr. Nai, all the panelists with me, and uh, and especially the attendees who who had the patience to to be to have energies till the end of the day. So we, I'm I'm thankful to. 
to organizers, especially the DGH and the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, who who have given me this opportunity to to talk on on this very important session that session chair has already described importance of digital transformation in ENP sector. So that's that's the way ahead. That's the roadmap. That's the road ahead for uh, for the for all the sectors, especially the oil and gas sectors, who have to face the 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 challenges, eh? especially from from the market forces, eh? crude oil price. So that's where I think the contributions from digital transformations are going to help to offset some of those downturns which happens during these these upheaval times for the oil and gas industry. So. Uh, Sivangi, you want to share my 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 presentation, or I have to I have to do it myself. Yeah, yeah so yeah. all right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So I started sharing. Okay, all right. See, see, done. I think. All right, good. All right. So let me put it the full screen mode. So that's that's where it is. So yeah. the the first the first talk uh, which is mine today is preparing next generation workforce and organizational cultures for digital transformations. So as you can see that the, the subject covers a few keywords. One is the next generation workforce, which is uh, a responsibility uh, of all the stakeholders, uh, industry to, to facilitate, to develop an ecosystems for, for digital enablers to come in and the, and the academics eh, like us, universities, which have to align to the industry needs to produce uh, industry ready workforce. So that's uh, that's what we'll be talking about. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm starting with the, uh, some of these. They are the 14 principles of the future organizations, uh, which are captured in a very nice book, actually, which is published by, by Jacob Morgan. Hey? The name of the book is Future of Work. So these key concepts. So I'm going to speak one or two, uh, three of them, which are, which are more. Uh, but every one of them is, is a key, key principle or key skills that the future organization will need. A globally distributed with smaller teams, right? The smaller, the better. That's the concept. Two pizza rule. We are absolutely seeing a shift towards organizations, command and conquering. Connected workforce, I think that's the concept that uh, the digital enablers uh, do for the oil and gas companies. So you have the workforce which is digitally connected any anytime, anywhere, on any device. That means you are using collaborative tools and technologies to, to affect these changes. So that's, that's very, very important. Entrepreneurial, the same spirit, passion, creativity and entrepreneurs have that to be imbibed into your organizations. But there are many others which are, which are very, very important actually. So we'll be talking a little bit of that. We'll try to cover in some of these slides uh, given the time frame that I have. So please move on to the next. All right, so coming to the oil and gas sectors. So digitizations, a new era for oil and gas, that's what we are talking about. We are talking about the six drivers which are which are important in shaping the landscape in which each of the skill emerges. Eh? So these are, these are what it is, the main, eh? and then uh, the dope telling with the skills. So uh, there's some text which is self-explanatory, but I think the main theme is digital transformation is, is the way we, the companies, need to go ahead. Uh, beyond the economic gains. So one is the economic gains that we'll be talking about, but beyond the economic gains, which will which will involve an ecosystem, building an ecosystem where the workforce, uh, workforce believe that they, 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 they love to work there rather than they need to be there. So that's the responsibility of the oil and gas companies. But in terms of the economic gains, right, obviously, the the three if you ask me what are the three three main skills or the areas that the companies would like to invest the first is the digital 
right? And this is this is what is uh, from all the data that we have collected. The second is the business model because the company needs to do business, and the third is third area is the revenue management. So these are because I teach in a business school, so there are a lot of a lot of areas we cover in in part of business models and revenue management. But digital transformation, therefore, is emerging, is the key driver for sweeping changes in the world. Connectivity has empowered millions of people. So these statements are self-explanatory. Uh, oil and gas together, yes. Uh, industrial revolutions, oil and gas industry has played a pivotal role in economic transformations. Today, the industry has the opportunity to redefine its boundaries through digitization. Eh? But there are more challenges ahead. The, uh, the, the, you know, the, the disruptions that have that happened in the oil and gas industry, uh, together with the demands for the climate change accountability. So these are some of the new areas that that becomes part of the 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 workforce, the the organizational ecosystems, uh, and the skills. You need uh, skills development in these areas. Uh, industry need to transform and digitization is among the key drivers. Go to the next, please. All right. So, so this is the basic sense. Actually, I've taken this from a very nice document that uh, we have contributed recently, uh, along with the All India Limited. This is from Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Uh, Mr. Datta is is my partner in this, right? And so is so so our friends from All India Limited. So we are talking about these are the key business drivers. So we are talking why we need uh, in cross upstream or. The entire full full spectrum oil and gas uh, processes, uh, cycle time. We are talking reduction in cycle time, faster computing, quick access to data information. That's very very important. So the data becomes data is very very important. Data, and then everything is related to data, right? So that that's what I'm going to talk. Improved prediction and accuracy, safe and sustainable operations. That's where the digital enablers will come in. Finding new resources and reserves, improved recovery. And reduce finding costs. So going down on the on the cost, 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 you know, the, both capital and and capital costs and the operating expenses. And so we have these numbers to to reflect. Go to the next, please. And safer, faster, and better. Next. So so these are the four elements that we are talking about. One is the data. Most important is data. Data curating information and making sense of the data is a key skills for the future. Then the policy that people have been talking about, policy, the policy, policy support, policy imperatives to to push the the these digital digital uh, digital inductions into into the oil and gas sectors. Uh, uh, the policy, the well a lot of lot of if you a uh, lot of things are happening in this area, but some of the challenges that we have been facing are, are the in terms of the policies where the the standards, right? standards in data, both structural and unstructural data, uh, the data transfer, how how well, whether the seamless data transfer can happen between between units, between between enterprises, whether there is there is a knowledge data management of all the repository of data that we have, well we have. A national data repository, some kind of initiative in that, but these are, or or there are there are any digital incentives? There are any government incentives for for digital induction induction into into their processes? So these are some of the things we have covered as as part of our our uh, digital ENP roadmap of India. Technology is the key driver. We already, I think, the chairman has very very nicely explained that. But the ecosystems, that's the responsibility on the part of the government, on the part of the organizations to develop an ecosystem, to develop an ecosystem. Ecosystem will, will include everything, every, every element that builds that organization. So this is very, very important. Go to the next slide, please. All right. So we are talking in terms of the value framework, which is the maximizing value in oil and gas. So successful digital transformations can boost the profitability of oil and gas firms, improve workforce safety and benefit society through reduced emissions, as well as saving for customers. So there are three three main things into this slide. You can see that this is the this is the maximizing value uh, of the oil and gas. But you have 
the three three main key areas which are embedded into this you have a financial performance that i talked about is the economic gains so it's directly directly related then you have a customer value and then you have the environment and social social value and so these are in the in this framework value creation in the industry is a function of the financial performance and customer environmental and social societal value go to the next please all right so these are these are the slides which i have taken from the public this is from world economic forum uh, together with accenture so this is the kind of investment so if you look into this uh, into this slide you can see that the the most em more emerging the most emerging areas in in digital in terms of investments are the big data analytics that's one second is the I iot or iot and and then you have the mobile devices so the data big data analytics so that's where the the companies you know this is something which is which uh, we yeah, and i'm going to talk on the academic side how we are aligning our courses to to imbibe to induct these these digital these digi digital concepts into our course curriculum but uh, big data because as i said that the petabytes and petabytes of data uh, a rig a drilling to rig or the platform uh, will have hundred thousand sensors for example which therefore the total data that can generate would be of the order of tens of petaflops or petabytes over the asset lifetime so what do you do with with that data whether we, we can use the cognitive tools that's what we are using analytics uh, various various tools that uh, that we are talking about to filter and and extract information out of this data which is coming in real time go to the next so these are some kind of the values we are talking 1.6 trillion of value for the industry is customers and the wider society the the total estimated value but these are some some numbers these numbers uh, are uh, will go up as as more companies more data flows in into the public domain go to the next slide please so so as far as the upstream is concerned so this is the very nice slide which captures most of the digital most of the digital world digital technologies that are applied to the upstream sector starting with the multi client data as somebody has already in my previous speakers my previous sessions they talked about so the benefits of multi client data which is the 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 proprietary data no? so it's it has a huge impact on the not only the cost but also the time to the first oil so time to the first oil can be reduced can be reduced significantly by by two uh, well the the main the highest impact of of everything together on this chart is the clouds that's that's this cloud tap uh, is has the highest impact in terms of in terms of the oil gas oil and gas sector oil and gas benefits today but uh, talking on that multi client data uh, we are talking incentive digital investments minimum investment commitments so relax procurement so that's for the government policies uh, digital smart oil fields that's that's the goal so all we have smart oil and gas fields we are talking about cloud that's what i what i want to talk, talk on that clouds cloud 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 hosted environment which is the the on premise environments so the the companies are already already moved to the to the clouds clouds all the data which is coming in real time stories and access of data processing of data is happening on clouds and that's the way forward eh? so many of that is already there go to the next we'll we have to honor the time so and the second this part uh, of the slides is more on the academic sites eh? so one is the industry side that i've talked about the 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 ecosystems that you need to you need to build where the com the employees have to feel to work love to work rather than uh, the need based but the but the as a as a university as an academic because we are uh, we are closely dovetailing with uh, the industry uh, with the industry supports 
so are we we have a responsibility to to produce to produce a resource as a resource a, a young human resource uh, young we have to invest into human capital and development to to with uh, who are having a digital thinking yeah? digital thinking so what we are what we can do and what we should be doing in that will be covered into this so 21st century is learners as i am saying that so you are talking about knowledge what which means what we know and understand skills uh, character and meta learning meta cognition based abilities and skills uh, content on declarative knowledge procedural and task based knowledge and strategies and conditional knowledge next please so uh, this is a slide which uh, this is from a survey which is done uh, in, uh, from a number of senior managers were asked whether the the course curriculums which is taught at the universities teaching petroleum petroleum are adequate so this is learned from some of the some of the young guys who have joined their companies eh? right so majority of them are saying that okay all right on the left hand side so petroleum programs adequately prepare graduates with the skill and knowledgeable to be successful in oil and gas so they are satisfied but petroleum engineer programs adequately prepare graduates with skills and knowledge to be successful outside the oil and gas industry so there are there are many not takers of this uh, even when within the oil and gas industry though they are satisfied but there is always a thrust for for including the 21st century skills and i'm going to talk a little bit on that uh, which are not only the domain skills but the 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 school for life skills school of life involves leadership team building critical thinking critical thinking that's the area that's the area the school of life because we got to make them good human beings and eh? that's the not only good managers has to be a good human being so those attributes should be part of your curriculum which we have already this is already reflected in nep and as a ups we have already started this year uh, this we have 30% of the course syllabus is for is for school of life which includes uh, life skill courses which includes exploratory courses which also includes some of the signature courses that that the university has go to the next please curriculum so these are i'm talking about these are your life skill courses that that are taught which become part of your domain courses so when you run a program whether it's petroleum engineering program or mba oil and gas programs so these are these are taught these became these are integrated with your course curriculum creativity critical thinking communication and collaborations next so in conclusion so in conclusion uh, some of the areas that i would like to talk about one is the size of the digital price that's important i have shown that it's trillion dollars savings more than that is uh, the some of the areas which are uh, which are some of the some of the problem areas into digitization or adapting digitization is is digital tenacity and work culture that needs to be improved because many of the companies though companies realize especially after these pandemics and uh, the crude oil price uh, fall from 2014s uh, they they found a way to to offset the cost uh, minimize their the expenses uh, through these digital processes but more from the pandemic the covid 19 that happened you know so this is this is a lot of changes i think companies companies have already adopted to a lot more changes need to be happen digital tenacity and workforce as what i'm saying digital maturity uh, what is the, so according to a survey only 36% of the companies are investing into digital right and of that only 13% of 13% are actually taking benefit from these digital processes that means they are translating the benefits from from the digital into into their into their uh, enterprise uh, enterprise outcomes which is financial and other things preparing workforce yes that's a responsibility for for both of us 
for all the stakeholders, industry to lead, and and the academia to support. So, with these few words, uh, I'm going to close uh, my my talk. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Mr. Chairman and Co-Chairman. Yeah. Thanks, Venali uh, Sahib. You know, you spoke very well about uh, the new era of oil and gas, data, policy, technology, and ecosystem together. So, what role it plays. And uh, now I request uh, the next speaker, who is my also colleague, uh, Sri Indra Dimna Datta, who will speak on petroleum data analytics, application of AI and ML in oil and gas industry. Mr. Datta, please. Thank you, Nayakji. Um, can we bring up the slides, please? Yeah, social friendly. Can you please share the slides, Mr. Datta, please? Yeah. Thank so you. it has come. Can you, uh, yeah, enlarge it full screen, then you can go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Nayakji, and thank you, my esteemed uh, panelist, uh, chairperson, and co chairperson. So it's a privilege uh, for me to talk about uh, this uh, very hot topic of uh, application of artificial intelligence, machine learning in upstream processes. So I will cover two things in particular, if you can go to the next slide. So today I will going to, I will be covering uh, two particular things. One is on uh, the use cases which we are implementing in cane oil and gas. And uh, I think that the applicability of those use cases are widespread in upstream industry. So I will, I have uh, selected a couple of them. I will quickly go through them. And uh, the, the important part uh, I want to touch on, like, uh, how do we uh, manage the whole deployment and the architecture of uh, AIML application and the ecosystem. So is it uh, going to be uh, a desktop based application where people will be developing the, the models and the applications in, in a Python scripts? Or is it going to be uh, some uh, standardized environment and architecture where the enterprise wide uh, uh, application development collaboration will be possible. So uh, there are different approaches to the model deployment and management. I am trying to touch uh, what is, I think is the best uh, suited for a uh, big operators uh, and the people from those industries who are uh, present in this uh, forum. Next slide, please. So to start with, uh, uh, this is particularly important for the asset health uh, monitoring. And uh, this uh, we have implemented in uh, uh, in our RJ oil acid, Rajasthan oil acid. This is uh, called your predictive analytics based uh, asset health monitoring and performance improvement. So what we are trying to do here is like uh, at present, we have concentrated on the surface critical equipment of uh, pumps, uh, compressors, and uh, your turbine-based generators. Uh, we are trying to build a digital twin in uh, cloud. And how can we bring up the advisories of imminent failures from this model in, uh, in advance? So the algorithms, what we are using here is not only the, the first principle or physics based model, but we are also bringing the, the machine learning based model here. How we are bringing the machine learning based model in this particular topic. So we have provided uh, the, the uh, past failure data as well as the, the critical parameters of the past records. Now, once we have fed the, the past records of the critical parameters along with the failure information, the advanced pattern recognition algorithm, which is uh, running in this particular uh, software, is able to identify that what are the trends, what are the, the signatures which comes before the failure. And then what happens is like when the real-time data actually flows into this model, 
it has an ability to build some of the the, the supervised learning uh, models like your regression or nn based uh, models to to predict the the future values of a particular uh, parameter let's say uh, the pump discharge parameter right uh, pump discharge pressure can be modeled so that the future value of that is uh, predicted and then that future value is compared with those earlier detected signatures to understand that whether it is going into a zone which is abnormal if it is then raise an alarm give an advisory and it is not only limited to a particular system but it is also spread in the different subsystem so it could be possible to predict a particular issue with your, with your let's say uh, electrical model or the, the the gearbox coupling or let's say the the centrifugal pump so it is possible that uh, uh, different types of failures which can be predicted uh, uh, well in advance and then you have an opportunity to act on them next slide please so the next use case which i have chosen uh, this one we have deployed in uh, Aishwarya Upper Fatehgarh Reservoir. Again, this is uh, uh, part of our Rajasthan oil asset, part of uh, uh, MBA asset, Mangala Bhagya Aishwarya. Now, what we have done here, it's uh, again uh, uh, an optimization model, what we have put, but the optimization uh, algorithm is backed up by the AI and ML based uh, technologies. So what it does, so first of all, we have to understand that uh, in this particular field, we are having water flood. And slowly we are moving to polymer flood as well. But as part of water flood, we have multiple injectors and multiple producers. Now these injectors and producers, how they are connected, if we are able to identify the connections well, then our job is easy from the reservoir engineering pur purposes. Like uh, I know that in this particular injector, I will send this amount of uh, water so that I can maximize my production from uh, X or Y number of uh, the producer. So this interconnectivity of your producers and the injectors are generally traditionally done by the, the streamline based uh, allocation or a geometric allocation. But now as we have the past data, as Ms. Dr. Penoli was saying about uh, the data is the key thing here. And we have a huge amount of data from the, the all the past production, what we have done uh, in the last few years, right? So we know that this is the profile of the injection and this is the profile of the production. And if we are able to bring that historical data through some supervised learning model here, then we will be able to even augment the physics-based model so that the, the, the interconnectivity, the injectivity uh, connections are well understood. And once we know that, then we can put some of the constraints because again, uh, water is a constraint for us, right? Because there is a constraint in the surface facility. So we know that this is the volume of water, let's say uh, 10,000 or 15,000, 20,000 barrels of water we can pump in a day. Now, this is the constraint. If I am rejigging the, the injection in the different injectors, then I will be able to uh, extract more oil uh, from the, the subsurface to surface. Uh, that's the, the primary objective. Secondary objective is like you are uh, saving your critical resource on the water. And the third objective is like uh, the, the water cut uh, is going to improve. And if you have an improvement in water cut, then your uh, subsidiary uh, facilities which are responsible for your separation is not going to be overwhelmed. So, so there are multiple benefits which can be drawn out of this uh, project. Next slide, please. So this is again a very interesting project uh, which we have done in uh, tight oil, tight, uh, tight oil and tight gas based reservoir. So where we have to do uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing and uh, this is all unconventional reservoirs. Now, 
there is an unwanted scenario called your screen out or pressure out which can happen during the hydraulic fracturing process and you definitely want to avoid that so the the whole purpose of this model was to predict that if uh, the the hydraulic job starts in a particular uh, uh, a stage of uh, a frac a process can we predict that and if we are able to predict that then how can we ensure that some of the levers what we have like uh, your uh, the rate at which we are pumping or the propent concentration uh, that we are sending into the downhole can be uh, controlled so that you are not hitting the 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 very scenario of uh, screen out or uh, pressure out so there are two major things here one is like uh, the rock properties and the rock properties are measured through your well logs through your uh, porosity or permeability the 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 density of the the rock the stress strain young's modulus what not we have all those data and we also have the the previous record of uh, hydraulic job where the treating pressure profile has been captured now as we know the previous record again this is a supervised model because we are actually going to the the past data and trying to see that this is the particular uh, pressure profile which has been uh, obtained in a particular frac job process which has got a particular rock properties now you have to relate these two things like the the, the pressure profile and the rock properties if this can be relate then whenever a new log file comes uh, it could be a last file or anything like that you would be able to feed into this uh, uh, model and it can tell that okay based on your all your properties there is a highly likely chance of uh, hitting a screen out uh, perhaps you should restrict uh, your uh, uh, the 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 pumping rate to this particular level as well as the propent concentration should be equally but distributed over the frac job so so the the frac engineer can take an informed decision when he is or she is actually performing the job so next slide please again this is uh, a very interesting project what we have done in uh, bhagyam so bhagyam is uh, the shallower of the wells and the field what we have in mba and uh, the fluid is a little bit more viscous so we have a pcp kind of a pump progressing capacity cavity pumps which are used as a artificial lift uh, system now the the gauge which uh, is put uh, during uh, the well completion uh, which is required for measuring of your uh, flowing bottom hole pressure or your pump intake pressure does not work always and it generally goes bad in a couple of months time so the problem statement was like if we have uh, past data of uh, flowing bottom hole pressures for different type of wells then is it possible to predict the current uh, flowing bottom hole pressure for a particular well where the gauge is not working and how did we do it so we have again put uh, an ensemble based uh, a regression model and we have coupled multiple uh, supervised learning model here and we have narrowed down the feature says like your uh, top hole pressure uh rod speed rod top motor current and a few of the other parameters to rightly predict that this could be your uh flowing bottom hole pressure the the initial accuracy of this model was around uh, 70% to 75% and uh, we are in the process of improving it to close to 90% so then it will be uh i think uh, very credibly deployed into the field and the engineers will get benefited out of it next slide please so but this is again we haven't deployed but uh, this is in line what we want to really work on this is more on the 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 gng space uh, of the 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 enp value chain uh, where we have uh, the seismic uh, images and the, the seismic uh, raw and process data so once we put those uh, data and the images together 
the job of the the geologist or the geophysicist is to understand that uh, uh, how the fault lines are uh, are paced uh, into the the real uh, uh, subsurface area right so that the 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 exact nature of the the seismic uh, data can be understood as well as uh, your uh, 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 rock uh, properties and where the fault lines are there can be understood. So now we have uh, done a lot of uh, analysis on these seismic images earlier. We have the experts available whose job is to do this kind of analysis. And they have understood that, okay, if this is the input image, uh, through my expertise and through my uh, knowledge, I will be able to tell that these are the fault lines which are present. Now, how can we utilize that expertise and put it into the, the machine learning model. Because we know this is my input and this is the output and there are 100 sets of this input and output at present. Now, if we can fit it into a, a, a supervised learning model, it is possible that the machine itself can at least do this work in the future. And that's what our, our vision is. This will definitely reduce the, the time for this type of uh, uh, analysis, and it is going to help uh, in the, the productivity of our engineers. Next slide, please. So I think uh, that's a, a quick overview on some of the use cases that we have uh, deployed in uh, Kane and uh, what we are trying to do. Uh, there are many more, but uh, uh, due to the paucity of time, I have restricted to four to five number of use cases. The other topic which I quickly want to cover is the, the deployment model. And this is the last slide what I have. So the deployment model is very important for the sustainability of the, the AI and ML model that your engineers are developing. And uh, how to sustain it, how to make it more uh, democratic so that any of our engineers can come to a platform and they can develop something. And maybe the, down the line in a year, uh, a new, uh, a fresh engineer is coming who should be able to use that work and build on top of it. So what we have done here is like, uh, we have uh, uh, divided the whole data set into two major buckets. One is your exploration data, other is the production data. In the exploration, we have uh, geological data, geospatial, petrophysical data, and whatnot. So reservoir uh, engineering related data. And in the production side, we have the production reports, the production allocation figures, your uh, time series data, so all those data are present in the, the production data. So we have tried to, to merge all these data sources to a single uh, cloud. And uh, through that cloud, we are actually serving that data to multiple applications. Now, when I'm talking about multiple applications, most of these applications are can be categorized into two buckets. One is on the, the presentation layer and uh, another on the analytical layer. Now, for today's topic, as we are discussing AI and ML based uh, uh, workflows and the use cases. So the, the cloud based uh, services allow you to enable the, the machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence based applications, tools and services, which can be immediately enabled and can tap into the, the very same data lake where all the data is present. And the presentation layer, what I was talking about is to show the data, to interact with the data, and that can be done through two different type of technologies which are available in the market at present. It could be TIPCO Spotfire, it could be Microsoft Power BI, or maybe in AWS case, it could be any applications of the SageMaker Studio. So, so that's, I think, the way to go. And what are the benefits of it? So you are going to get a model development, integrated development environment. Uh, the version controlling can be uh, is very well possible. It is a multi-user environment. And uh, you can have continuous and batch uh, deployment of the models. And you can also track the usage and different other statistics uh, through that uh, same uh, workspace uh, that has been uh, part of the development environment. 
so so that's what i have to cover in today's uh, session i hope it is uh, useful for all of you if for any questions maybe you can contact me offline so thank you thanks for the for your time over to you naiji yeah th thanks uh, tata ji uh, you have spoke very well about predictive analysis real time data data driven water flow optimization and what are the advantages uh, for digitization in kl and oil and gas in the last so many years so now let us hear from <coughs> mr anup sharma ji facilitating policy framework for accelerating growth of digitization anup sharma ji yes yeah. thank you mr naik good evening everyone respected session chair shri goswami ji distinguished co speakers and the participants through virtual mode mr pingi has definitely done a great job by involving all stakeholders in preparing digitalization roadmap for indian ent industry it was a extensive work carried out and all aspects of digitalization was uh, threadbare discussed by the stakeholders i was also part of it uh, one of the teams and i will be today talking about the policy framework for accelerating growth of digitalization policy is something everyone likes to comment on uh, sagat can you uh, share the slide yeah social friendly can you send yeah okay so next go to the next slide uh, digitalization is no more a buzzword now companies are transforming their business through this oil and gas sector across the world is also transforming through new business models uh, you have heard to mr datta just now and uh, even in india uh, some of the places uh, the operators are now transforming their business through this model we have seen the trailer of advantages of digitalization during the pandemic those who were prepared could reap the benefit of it and we all know picture abhi baki hai and that is the reason we are we are discussing digitalization as an important topic in upstream ahead vision 2050 within the production and manufacturing industry industry 4.0 has shifted focus on intelligent production processes in complex environment enabling communication between the human machine and product through self controlled and cyber physical controlled interfaces successful digitalization will require collaboration between industry leaders technology providers and the policy makers while digital transformation has tremendous potential to benefit industry and society it can only be achieved with focused collaboration among all stakeholders the policy framework needs to be seen at three levels first is national already a lot has been done by government to promote the digitalization digital india make in india jam are some of the initiatives which are paying high dividend more such initiatives are desired for further accelerating the digitalization in india and government is continuously doing this at mopng dgh level the ministry has proactively taken up the digital roadmap the review is required from time to time as it's a fast changing environment they are also promoting startups which is required to be further promoted there is distinct thrust being given by ministry for digitalization they are working intensively with the stakeholders for expediting the digitalization dgh is also doing their bit by leading and getting the policies implemented across the sector this needs to be further expedited for digital, uh, desired digitalization to be done timely in the inaugural session js shri amarnath intimated that the ndr is going to be a separate company this is a welcome step it is expected to improve the data sharing and in turn efforts towards the atmanirbhar bharat the ministry is also looking into the cloud computing aspects which is much desired 
now when it comes to the organization level this is some this is a area which is required much more improvement uh, for the policy framework level considering the fast pace of the changes procurement and projects of digital nature needs to be seen differently compared to other normal projects and procurement the operator needs to orient their policies accordingly lot of machines and systems need to be changed for taking up the industry 4.0 benefit efforts are being done you have seen mr datta has already uh, shown some of the examples and this is required to be expedited tremendously to uh, reap the benefits of uh, digitalization the technology providers also need to tweak their policies considering the indian business environment uh, i was expecting that some of the uh, industry uh, people also join that uh, this presentation somehow they are not there uh, because they are also technology service providers are also required to tweak their policies for the um, better digitalization of indian ent companies next slide there are certain policy aspects which are not to be missed uh, one is develop global data standards uh, some of this is talked by uh, mr panuli and policies related to the data sharing and security here one of the objective is to encourage the transparency is the in the operations when we see we find that uh, at places it is me it is even missing in the organization this is to be improved as a policy also and as a culture also the data and reports are being altered at places which is to be definitely uh, curbed policy needs to be framed and implemented dif at different level to encourage the transparency adopting global standards will allow us to uh, share the data better and to uh, use the standard softwares and uh, to use analytics in a better way regarding sharing of data again this is a matter which is lacking in the organizations also and further it is required to be checked policies are required to be framed and implemented in a way that companies are benefited by sharing the data and therefore they are compelled to share the data this will benefit in a big way for the country as the they will get best deal from the open innovators so these policies are required to be uh, given due thrust by the operators and prepare accordingly for the implementation there is a the requirement that various machine data is to be shared online as uh, some of the things uh, mr datta was talking uh, oems this is required to be shared with oems for better maintenance through machine learning models major breakdowns can be avoided through this companies need to adopt policies in this regard this will also require technological upgradation at many places because uh, there are places where the machines are very old policy is required for the collaboration between operators and for building the robust machine learning models for better analysis the policy regarding data security also needs to be tweaked presently government policies are stringent about data residency relaxing data residency policy is need of our this is this will ease the collaboration among the operators also uh, conducive policy is also required for the use of public cloud which is uh, many companies still hesitate to do that because best of the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence can be uh, attained through the public clouds additionally data security regulations and intellectual property frameworks needs to be assessed and redefined for data sharing along value chains 
so that the companies feel confident and not compromised in discussing their data. Next slide, please. Policymakers have an important role in developing ecosystem for innovation. Government and MOPNG is already giving a lot of incentives and investment in digital technologies. The startups are already being given a good deal. Companies like ONGC are be given incentives to startups. Still, there is a lot of talent in India which is to be tapped. They should facilitate strategic alliance in the development of digital resources. The policy framework should therefore incentivize investment in digital technology to build local capabilities. This will require engaging inno innovators and entrepreneurs to deliver technological advanced solution for digital upgradation of ENP companies. They uh, also need to run the pilots uh, for better uh, confidence. An important aspect is also to uh, create a clear regulatory framework to promote the shift towards the low carbon economy and promoting a more inclusive society. Next slide, please. Here, uh, apart from the policy, what are the roles the stakeholders have? Uh, that also I am discussing. MOPNG has a role to review, first of all, for uh, review and approve the policy recommendation so that the identified digital initiatives can take off promptly. Beyond, the, beyond this, they are also required to actively involve an interministerial group to expedite approvals. Uh, for example, in case of drones, the DGCA approvals are required or for uh, some of the data security matters, uh, Ministry of Home is also to be consulted. Next slide. DGH has to see that the policies recommendations are implemented. Apart from that, they are also to they are also required to lead and drive central initiatives. They should also identify and mandate common minimum set of digital initiatives that all operators should deploy. They are also required to collaborate with National Data Re uh, Repository for easy and seamless access of data by ENP players. Next slide, please. The operators must assign digital as a top priority. Develop a digital roadmap of their own. They should set up a digital center of excellence. They should invest in human capital and promote new digital thinking. They have to train their current man manpower for skill upgradation, conduct company-wide digital workshops, continue to develop their capabilities by continuous investment because this is a, a continued exercise. Next slide, please. Next is technology service providers. Uh, they also have a very important role to pay, play. First of all, they have to adopt to the Indian environment. Uh, they should come forward to partner the operators, deploy the identified digital initiatives in the roadmap. They should update products and solution in line with the Indian specific needs. Most importantly, they should adopt to the Indian environment policies, methodology, because it's seen at times there are delays in finalizing digital initiatives as technology providers are not accepting terms and conditions and they don't even register to jam. At times uh, it is also seen that uh, there are policies which are not at all conducive for Indian operators to uh, award the jobs. To conclude, I would like to say that the stakeholders, policy makers, operators and technology providers 
all of them will be required to work jointly for the successful and timely digitalization of ENP sector. Next slide. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sarma Saab. Uh, excellent speech. And uh, you have spoken very well on the policy aspects of uh, data sharing, data security, and data residency, use of public cloud, roles and responsibility of the stakeholders in this. So uh, I will not take much time. Now, sir, some questions for the speakers. One question for the uh, Mr. P.K. Penuli. This is from Udit Jagtap, a digital lead engineer, ACME. Sir, is EPS offering any sort of training or course to develop new edge ENP workforce? We need educational program to get trained on such new cutting edge technologies. Panel, sir. I think Panel, sir, uh, I couldn't see him here. Uh, uh, this, can you see him? Is, So, uh, uh, Datta ji or Samadha, can you respond to these questions? Because I think it is my two panelists. I think has left, uh, yeah. but it was for So, can you respond to this? Because Mr. Udit Jagtap has uh, asked this question. Uh, can you repeat the question again? So, sir, UPS is offering any sort of training or course to develop new as ENP yeah. workforce. It's very specific to UPS, probably. Uh, Let us go to the next question. This yeah. is one to you. You know, uh, this is uh, uh, to Mr. Datta. It is from ML Engineering CS. How ML and data science professionals can take part in AI, oblique AM, ML, work <coughs> off stream use case? We have some common use case in other industries like telecom where we deployed model at scale. How can we effectively collaborate? I think that's a very pertinent uh, question. So uh, we uh, have a good connect with the partner ecosystem to understand that uh, what's happening in the other industries. And uh, we are very open uh, to, to imbibe uh, those uh, changes and uh, the technologies that is getting used. So to, to say that, uh, let's say, uh, the, the forecasting technologies, what we use as part of ML, or the prediction technologies, what we use, those are some of the things which are already available, let's say in the telecom industry in form of, let's say the, the, the customer churn or uh, segmenting your profitable customer with uh, the not so profitable customer, like you segregate your uh, wells, right? Uh, which are your highly producing wells or which are your not so profitable wells. There are different technologies which are available, and we are very open to that. Uh, so definitely, we can discuss how more we can collaborate on that. There is one more question from say Mr. Udit Jagtap. No, another person, Mr. Udit Jagtap, uh, digital lead engineer ACME to Mr. Datta. Are you using condition monitoring for rotary equipment like pumps and compressor TC? Yes, we are using. At least for the, the critical equipment, uh, we are using uh, the condition-based monitoring, vibration monitoring uh, from some of the leading uh, service uh, providers. And uh, those are also basically a very critical input to this uh, predictive analytics model, uh, which is trying to predict the, the failures and the uh, generating, they want to generate the, the advisories of any of the upcoming issues, right? So yes, we are using that. So um, there is uh, one more question from the uh, same Udit Jagtar to Anup Sarmaji. Where a uh, young digital oil and gas enthusiast can go for learning such new age technologies? There is a huge market for application of for such technology. Can ONGC set up a training institute which teaches the new age engineers? Can you? Give this to your board, please. So, this is for that's, a, uh, that's a very good uh, suggestion, as such, and uh, we can uh, forward it to ONGC or, uh, for that matter, maybe to the ministry that some sort of uh, uh, institute can be there, which can be uh, uh, helped by ONGC and some other uh, operators. 
so that uh, this can be useful for the young generation to come forward and learn about the ai and ml and various new technologies in fact you know uh, secretary mo png set up a monitoring committee or i am a member who will take all these to this monitoring committees which are arising out of this conclap and future meetings so you know, this this session secretary has specially told is a very important session for the young and the future generations so uh, and one more questions uh, uh, for the anup sharma ji uh, by the ml engineers si from uh, what do you mean by the indian conditions Uh, the indian conditions uh, means uh, there are uh, especially for the government uh, sector uh, there are a uh, lot many constraints in which uh, they have to take decisions so uh, uh, the international companies have their set rules they don't uh, budge from there they don't come down to their uh, these conditions that is what i wanted to uh, tell about some of the uh, kind of companies don't even partner with other uh, this thing uh, jv or some other so that uh, they can participate in some tenders or something uh, they they want to uh, whereas for indian uh, this thing even through jam or otherwise if you have to participate in some of the tenders you have to have some indian uh, stake uh, that is how the things are easier compared to the um, going for a oem uh, internationally so this is what i wanted to tell so the last question is for mr tar it is from mr uh, is from suman bhattacharya director geo science uh, panajia integrator reserve solutions so mr datta my question is related to ml and ai for g and g applications do you have any tools to validate the interpretation generated through the methods and algorithm used so um, for if you are asking about uh, petro technical applications and uh, the uh, some of the gng applications so i will divide it into two ways where you have uh, let's say an uh, uh, image based analysis that still needs a uh, 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 manual calibration and generally what we do here is like uh, we divide the data set into uh, uh your uh, training data set and the validation data set so once we run uh, once we develop the model using the training data set then we try to see that okay with the, the separated out data set which is used only for uh, the validation purpose what is the accuracy and that gives us some idea about that how the how good will be that model but if it is a very particular image analysis kind of an application for gng um it's a little bit uh, complex we don't that's tool for that but definitely uh, we are exploring but this uh, division of the data set into your uh, training and validation is a, a very uh, common feature for any of the the ml based tools and that we generally do so thank you datta ji you know for the answering some questions and uh, we would have taken up some more questions but now it is too late i should not hold the speakers chairman for long time uh, you know it was very interesting session we missed mr haji singh kalra he could not uh, give his speech today so but uh, the summary is uh, we have met and we'll circulate to the, all the public and uh, also to the speakers out of this session and it was very useful for this industry and for the future for the vision for 2050 so thank you and i will uh, request all the audience and the speakers to i think there is some communication issue from uh, mr nayak join tomorrow at sapang not for the concluding i will request mr goswami to conclude this yeah uh, thank you thank you mr nayak huh. Uh, Sandeep, I do not know whether uh, we can give a huge round of applause to this all these participants and all these speakers in the virtual forum. But uh, I would uh, request everyone to give a big round of applause to these uh, speakers. Uh, they sp they spoke very nicely in all the all 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 all, all, all uh, subjects, and definitely it's a, a big a big move, uh, big move from everybody. 
So, um, Mr. Finally, very uh, nicely explained uh, how the next gen workforce will be work connect with the connected workforce concept and how faster and uh, better growth can be happening with that. And he very specifically told about the data collection. And uh, he once, one point he mentioned that the uh, data, not only collection of data, but the sense of the data, that is most important. That you will have to uh, know what is all about the data. So he also talked about uh, big data, that is futuristic uh, technologies and cognitive tools. I was supposed to talk about that, but uh, due to time limitation and all, I, I didn't spoke on that. But this is a big thing coming up. Uh, definitely we'll be uh, having uh, more and more things coming up in in days, in the coming days. So uh, I a big thank you to Mr. Finally. Uh, next, uh, introducing the doctor, then uh, he's uh, also very specific, uh, to a very, very, very specific presentation. He talked about two specific things. One is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications and uh, the model deployment and management uh, to enterprise. This is very specific to his uh, the business. And uh, really, it was it is very heartening to note that the asset health monitoring, the pre predictive analysis, uh, what you are doing right now. So it was a dream at one point of time. I am also coming from that background, and I know the pain of the people. How people struggle to know the uh, predictive behavior of the equipment and machineries. So as we are going to this phase, definitely it will be helping everybody. Uh, so we can we we can be very uh, the. Uh, hopeful that uh, in the coming days uh, the uh, the things will be more easier and the water flooding what we are doing uh, for years together but how the water is flowing what is the uh, pattern everything if we can get the data all the time then definitely it's a very helpful technology for uh, the upstream companies so that is a really really uh, nice presentation from Mr. Dutta. Thank you, Mr. Dutta, for presenting so nicely and for so vividly about your the uh, way you are doing. The uh, the last presentation from uh, Anup Sharma uh, was uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, he talked about policy, mostly uh, facilitating the policy framework. That is definitely the most important thing as of now. Uh, we the entire ENP fraternity, then the policymakers, MOPNZ, DZH then organization level, even the, at the vendors level also, we'll have to act properly. As he has rightly mentioned that we'll have to work in the uh, Indian environment because the uh, most of the technologies from are from outside and they will have to work in the Indian environment. He explained that also, uh, what is Indian environment. Basically, uh, the people have to accept the terms and conditions of the Indian environment. In one case, we found that the uh, party is not willing to enroll in the GST. Some people are not willing to en enroll in the ZEM. So these are the small, small things, but uh, all these things will have to be overcome. And then only we can uh, go for uh, the best utilization of this technology. So uh, my thank you to all uh, the uh, presenters and all the participants also, because they uh, continued for a long time and uh, they had very nice questions. In fact, uh, there was a question to Mr. Pinoli. I have answered to Mr. Zak. Uh, this uh, Mr. Udit, that he will have to talk uh, personally to him because he is not as of now in the uh, seat. So uh, definitely he will talk to him. I have seen he has taken his email also. He has taken Mr. Pinoli's email also. So definitely uh, the things will be better in the uh, in the coming days. Uh, with that, with uh, that, I uh, thank each and everyone for joining. And uh, if Mr. Nayak wants to add something, he can definitely add to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, presently hearing to um, uh, speakers, session chair and everybody. And now it is time to conclude this session. And I request all the audience, also the current speakers, to join us. A very interesting session tomorrow. Uh, there is starting at 9 o'clock, financial challenges faced by the upstream industry. So uh, tomorrow we'll start at 9 o'clock because there are no BF cameras. So we'll start perfectly at 9 o'clock because we are running out of time. So I request all of you to join tomorrow at 9 o'clock on behalf of the organizing committee. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sandrima is telling something. No, sir, you have to say something. Please continue. No, no, I finished, please. 
Okay, thank you so much, sir, and thank you everyone in the panel. That was indeed a very, very wonderful and an exhaustive knowledge-bearing session. I believe all of us had gained a lot of knowledge, and we really enjoyed it. This marks the end of day one of the Upstream Ahead Summit, and on the behalf of the entire organizing committee, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to each and every one from the panel. Uh, thank you so much, and I would also like to thank each and everyone from the audience for being so engaging and for being a part of the today of today's event so thank you so much and i hope to see you all in day two of day two tomorrow uh, of the upstream ahead summit uh, we commence at 9 a.m and till then have a great evening ahead and stay safe thank you